everybody. I'm going to record on the computer. So I'm going to give Facebook just a minute or two to notify everybody that we're here and that we're live. So I'll fill a little bit of air time. Um, that reminded me, I've got to do one other quick thing. And then um, this is, so we're recording this as, as that just, that no, I think we are the only ones that hear it. I don't think Facebook hears it. But um, if you're watching us on Facebook now, this will reside on Facebook. So if you come in late and I'll put that in the comments too, you can always come back and see this later. It's going to be on Warwick's YouTube channel after as well. So, oh, we already got Anissa from South Carolina. So hello, Anissa. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's so much fun. I love these live events and it's just even, you know, it was Rachel, I think you were with us like in year one, I think. Oh you yeah. Doing, yeah. <laughs> I've been around for you've a been, while, but you've been doing this with us. It's, it's so fun and it's been so much fun. Um, and I'm still going to continue doing, we're back to doing live events at Warwick's. For yes. those of you joining us, we are in, located in San Diego, uh, La Jolla, California. Um, so if you're in the area, we'd love for you to stop by the store. But even though we're doing live events now, I still like the virtual stuff because it would be really hard, Linda, to get you and Rachel out to La Jolla. I know, to try to, yeah, to yeah. try to manage it, yeah. I was telling so, Julia that actually last year, last February, I went to La Jolla. It was the first trip that I had taken since the pandemic. And I went to Warwick's and it was, su it's such a beautiful, it's so beautiful. If anyone... <laughs> watching can get there in person. It's such a, it's like a perfect bookstore. It was so it's, nice to see it. It was my first bookstore. Like one of the first bookstores that I went, aside from my local, like right. in my town, the first bookstore I had gone to like since the pandemic. And yeah. I was just in love. It is. It's one of those where you just walk in, but I thank you because Nancy and the buyers do, we were talking about this earlier, Linda, they do a fantastic job at the store. So it is a treat going in there. It's a lot of fun. So Rachel, you got to get out here. One of these. Days. I know. Yes. So yes. <laughs> so um, if you're watching us on YouTube later, comments aren't happening and it's not live, but it's going to be a great conversation. So stay with us. Um, Hi, Christy Clancy. There's another drink. There's my drink Hi, buddies in here. Christy Clancy, <laughs> a brilliant author in her Our own friend. right. Amazing. I, I yeah. know. We love that Christy's here with us. Christy and I met at one of the, speaking of like the, your wonderful publisher, we met at um, one of those fun parties. And that's think, so fun. Well, that's so fun. So we're going to talk about this wonderful book, Linda. Congratulations. Thank it's you. such a good, yes, we do need a drink, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I hope you're going to talk about the cover because I love the cover. I love everything about this. Let's talk about the cover. Sure. <laughs> so um, for those of you that are joining us on Facebook, I'm going to put into the comment section how to order this lovely book and Rachel's book as well, the Mozart Code. Um, Arlene's here. Hello, Arlene. Um, she's thanking you for this treasure of a book, Linda, already. Aww, so she loved it so you. much. Thank Yay. you for reading it. Yes, I know. It's all, it's all, it must be amazing to have like, it, you put it out in the world and then people are reading it and talk to you about it. It's so much fun. It's, that. yeah, it's really, it's very special. It's very, very special. So also in that um, comment section, um, Rachel and Linda are going to talk for about 35 minutes. Got some questions for either of them. Pop those into the comment section and I'll bring those in when they're done with their conversation. And hello, Marilyn, for joining us too. So I'm going to do my job now, which is introducing these two lovely ladies and I'll get off the screen and let them chat. So. Linda Leugman, did I say it right? You say it right. I love it. <laughs> Is the author of The Wartime Sisters and The Two Family House. She received a BA in English and American Literature from Harvard College and a JD from Columbia Law School. She grew up in Long Meadow, Massachusetts, but now lives in Chappaqua. Did we say that? Chappaqua, New York? Yeah. Okay. You're um, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, usually I am the worst of pronunciation. So thank you. I mean, I'm having a, I'm having a good day today. Might need to go buy a lotto ticket or something. <laughs> and so Rachel McMillan is the author of the Hereford and Watts Mysteries, the Van Buren and DeLuca Mysteries, the three quarter time series of contemporary Viennese romances. And most recently, which I mentioned earlier, the Mozart Code. She is the author of Dream, Plan, Go. I love this. A travel guide to inspire independent adventure. She's joining us from Toronto. So ladies, have a good conversation. And oh, hi, Kathleen. Kathleen's in here with us too. Oh, so yeah. We got all kinds of friends in here with us. So have fun. Have a great conversation. We'll see you in a little bit. Okay. Oh, hi, Linda. Hi. I'm so excited to talk to you because we've so talked happy. on Twitter and I think everybody should know that one of the positive aspects of the pandemic and the lockdowns that we all experienced over the past 
to, I don't have any concept of time anymore. The past several years is the fact that authors found ways to communicate and connect over social media uh, to talk about their common experiences. And we are meeting Linda and this gorgeous book at the interception of a moment where the matchmaker's gift actually was born out of a Every, every author now has their pandemic book yeah. Yeah. and sometimes two or three pandemic books because <laughs> the pandemic started at its two weeks and it went on for a million years. Um, but your pandemic book started because you discovered a moment that drew you away from the manuscript you were working on. Yeah. and lured you into the world of this book so i kind of spoiler alert know this story because <laughs> uh, preface i actually begged linda for the pdf version the um, earliest version no. she had of this <laughs> book because when i read the publisher announcement on twitter and when i learned that it was a split time generations echoing between 1910 New York, the Edwardian era, um, the immigrant experience and 1994, I thought, this is all of my catnip. So I need to read this. <laughs> Linda was kind enough to loan me that. And it really struck me, Linda, when you wrote the author's note that you bear your experience about how the pandemic was awful and terrible. And let's never do that again. But you got a jewel of a story that lured you away from another manuscript you were working on. Can you give us the background about sure. that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so that was my gift, right? That was my pandemic gift. Um, so at the beginning of the very beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, I got a phone call from my daughter who was at that time a junior in college. And she was very yeah, She does not look old enough to have a daughter who is a junior <laughs> well, in college. I, <laughs> no, I am. Um, she was very teary and she said, they just told us we have to be out of the dorms by Sunday. So her school was one of the first, it might've been the first to send kids home. And she came home and she brought her roommate with her. So they lost like almost half of their junior year. Um, and they decided, you know, like it was a very nice thing to have her roommate come and to have them at least be able to still have like a little bit of a experience, a college ish, you know, experience. Um, so her roommate's name is Adele. My daughter is Ellie and Adele came and stayed with us for six months and she's a joy. She was a joy to have um, for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons why it was so wonderful to have both girls home was because before that I had been living like in this house of men. So it was me, and my, <laughs> husband, my teenage son and my dog. And then the girls, I'll call them girls, they're young women, but the girls came home and like all of a sudden we're, I'm not alone. Like I, I have like two people on, you know, my, my team <laughs> and they were so, um, just, they're just really bright, really ambitious, really interesting young women. And they would literally go from class to the dinner table, you know, like they were in the middle of college while they were with us. And so the conversation around the dinner table became really elevated. And they were talking about a lot about women's issues, issues women were facing, and they were talking about concerns that they had at school and, you know, concerns they had for the future and in the working world. They were asking me about some of my experiences. So my head was sort of in that direction for a little bit of time. And then at the same time as we were eating a ton of food all the time, <laughs> we were also binge watching. And the show we binge watched first was called Indian Matchmaking, which is a great show on Netflix. I highly recommend it. Um, and at the end of watching all of those episodes, Adele turned to me and said, you know, my grandmother was an Orthodox Jewish matchmaker and she was in Brooklyn. And then she pulled up on her phone, a New York times article about her grandmother with a big picture of her grandmother right in front, like a huge half page picture. And in the article, it talked about a couple matchmakers. And one of them had a bunch of filing cabinets where she kept records of all of her matches. 
And as a reader, my brain immediately went to like the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frank. Yes. That story, right? Absolutely. And so I, I spoke to my agent and I said, I'm kind of thinking of writing a matchmaker story. And I was working on a, on a book. I had a contract for it um, that we had just sort of negotiated. And the next day my agent called and said, you know, I've been thinking about this all night. I think we should go to them and just have a two book contract. I think we should tell them about this book because I think it's just going to be, I really want to read it. She talked to my editor and my editor was the same. And they said, actually, we want this book first. We want this book now. <laughs> so I put aside the book that I was working on, um, which honestly was really hard. Like, you know, I started it before the pandemic. I don't know, like it, it was hard to write. You know, you're a writer, it's hard to write. Yeah. During the pandemic. And the matchmaker idea was so fresh and so joyful. There was something about it. And everybody felt this way. My agent, my editor, me, we were all like, let's do this now. Like, let's work on this now. But the problem was, of course, that it's, if I, if any of us thinks about a book about matchmakers, you think romance and I'm a historical fiction writer. So I had to come at it from a historical point of view. So that was the first kind of, you know, the first thing, the first hurdle was yeah. what time period am I looking at? Where, when am I gonna set this? What, what are we looking at? I knew I wanted it to be a dual timeline story. Um, and so of course I had to pick the grandmother's timeline first cause that would fix when the granddaughter's timeline would be. So that was that was the first tough choice that I had to make. And it it's amazing because I love and for those of you who are not familiar with the publishing industry, often you're locked into a concept or a hook several mm -hmm. years before the book actually comes out. And yeah. so as a writer, when you pursue traditional publishing to get beautiful books like this, you're not at the whim of a muse or an artistic sense all the time. You do as much as you can within the limitations of needing to work with a publishing schedule. So the fact that this story blasted through is one of those kismet fate moments that you found joy within this prospect and so many others did as well. But what I am especially interested in is the fact that this is not so much a departure from the wartime sisters and the two family house, your previous novels, because you have already set up this world wherein your major motif is the forge of community and the cultivation of interaction. And I think it's so amazing because during COVID for the first time we read about war stories and they're horrible, but everybody was told rally around each other forge a community be together and covid was like stay six feet apart stay yeah. in your bubble never talk to anyone at all and i think that this is an amazing remnant of that world especially because it still heightens your always theme of women finding slices of strength that will last throughout generations and difficult time periods. And well, allow me to- That's a nice way of putting it. That's a very- <laughs> And there's always love in your books. Allow me to quote you. My whole <laughs> life, quote, <laughs> I fought for love, not just romantic love, you understand, the love of a parent for a child, the love of one friend for another, fight for something sweetheart not just against that's the best advice i can give you and if you can't decide what you want to fight for love is as good a cause as any and for anyone who lived and we all did through the past two and a half years of one exceptional hurdle of horror horror over another Often the concept of fighting is attributed to violence or a rebellion or pushing back against something. You set up a world where in the two different time periods she spoke of, we have a woman who is a matchmaker, who has a sixth sense that people are supposed to be together. And her granddaughter, who is a divorce lawyer, 
who has experienced the backlash of love. And you find the grace within these two different time periods to speak that love is its own war in a gentle and kind way. So I wanted to ask you after that long ramble, are these themes of community and family and love and its many different iterations always naturally inherent to you? Or do you ensure that they're sewn into each book? Because this applies not only this quote I read, not only applies to Matchmaker's Gift, but also to your previous two novels. Are you always aware of the themes that you're writing or do they just show up? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, I have a lot of thoughts. So, Because <laughs> it was a long, very yeah, family question. Well, I have a lot of thoughts. So first off, I do think that, that I loved when you said that this book was kismet because I do think that the reason that I responded to it and that my agent and editor responded to it is because it is about making connections. And yeah. if people read this book, they'll see that there are a lot of vignettes. So it, there are a lot of um, matches that are made in the book and they're like little vignettes, different people coming together with other people. So it's a book about connection written at a time when we were all so unconnected when we were all so isolated. So I think that was the appeal initially. In terms of um, themes of this book. So when I told you before, like that these conversations I was having with my daughter and her roommate around the dinner table were swirling in my head, they really were. So definitely love themes I was thinking about because, you know, it's called the matchmakers. It's about a matchmaker. So there has to be love. But I wasn't even really thinking romantically. I was thinking initially about the grandmother and the granddaughter. And so their sort of bond, their the 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 love between generations was sort of what I was thinking about first. Um, and I was also really thinking about this whole feminist angle, this whole idea that these women, both of them, have to fight to pursue their calling. And that was something that was really I knew was thematically going to be central to the story. And whether that was because of where my head was at at the time or because of the research and the things I found out later, I don't know. It was probably a combination of both. And then thematically also, I knew that there would be a push and pull between old world and new world because it's a book about you know an immigrant experience. It's a book but it's also a book about the more modern world. And what was happening at that time was that you're, you're talking about an immigrant community and most of them were used to the idea of matchmaking. Whether they were Jewish or from other countries, the idea of arranged marriage was a very fixed idea at that time. And the idea of marrying for love was a very modern idea. And so the old world versus the new world was another theme that and specifically in within the theme of love, like within the world of love and marriage, that was something that was going to be in the book. So those were sort of like my three, three main themes that were kind of in my head going in. And I do think that with this book more than any other, I was able to keep recognizing that. I don't think when I wrote my first book, I even knew like what themes I wanted to cover. I just knew that I had a story and that I had these characters and I wanted to tell that story. And with the second book too, I was getting closer to the idea of like really knowing what my themes were. My themes in the past two books were really fam like family, you know, really, really about families and the love between them, but the tension between them and the dysfunction among them and the discomfort. Um, and this book was the first time when I was writing where I really was more aware of them. So maybe that means I'm getting, I hope I'm getting better. I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, it's so organic. I hope I'm getting better. <laughs> what I love about this book is, as you say, it's not your traditional romance book, romancy in the, but yeah. romance as a conception does not necessarily just mean romantic love. And what mm -hmm. I love about this book is that it's as much about connection as it is about destiny. And about the way that our paths are forged for us and we just have to wake up yeah. and pay attention to what we're supposed to be 
learning. And I think that that's one of the magnificent gifts of this book is that it's like a little book of wisdom within itself. Um, and I confess, thanks to our culture and to media, that before match whoop, before Matchmaker's <laughs> Gift, um, Fiddler on the Roof, Crossing Delancey, which is one of my favorite romantic comedies ever, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, yeah. Hello Dolly, my conceptions of matchmaking were very much drawn from a female sphere. Yeah, And yet you establish that it was a man's profession. So can you talk a little bit about yeah. what that was like for Sarah, who we we think women and we match them with love and matchmaking it was it was a man's world yeah so when i first started thinking about the book i thought well maybe i want to write about the 1950s because everybody loves the 1950s it's a very yes. mismadely world yes and in fact like after i wrote this book they had this whole matchmaking plot thing in the in this show which was really funny for me to see um, which i want a spin-off show about just yeah that would be great yeah that would be, that would be great um yeah they actually sent my book to amy sherman paladino <laughs> like but no 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 i mean she's, fingers crossed yeah maybe. well i mean i haven't heard anything but i know they were sending it to her because clearly she likes matchmaking so i thought well maybe i'll write about the 50s but i really didn't know and then i started doing research so this whole the 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 fact that you quoted about men being the primary matchmakers at that time was something that I found out in the course of my research. And my research started with um, a website for the museum at Eldridge Street, which is a museum on the Lower East Side. It's one of the oldest synagogues in New York, and they have this great, beautiful space with all these amazing stained glass windows. They also have an online website and they have different virtual exhibits. And so it was an exhibit called Love on the Lower East Side. And Love on the Lower East Side referenced a wedding, the wedding of an immigrant, Ethel Clark. Her father was um, a Romanian immigrant. He owned a bunch of pickle stores in the city and a bunch of cucumber farms on Long Island. And they called him the pickle millionaire. And the New York Times wrote about the wedding. And they said, um, the scent of orange blossoms and roses mingled with the odor of dried herring and pickles. Um, which is just like, you know, a feast for the senses. And then they talked about there were 2000 people at this wedding. It was this enormous affair. And so I was like, I have to find out about this wedding. I went to try to find out more about it. And in the course of that research, I found other New York Times articles about matchmakers. Um, and there was one specific statistic that was quoted that said this was an article in 1910 and it said there are over 5,000 professional matchmakers in the city and the bulk of them are men and the traditional picture is a man of the tenements and the reason that they're men is because this is a very serious business that people are making their living with and people want to go to men for this serious business and so when I read that immediately it solved a lot of issues for me because I knew, okay, well, number one, now I know my time period because I'm not gonna write about the 50s. This period is too rich, it's too perfect. I wanna write about this period. And also I know what my conflict that my female matchmaker is going to be up against. She is gonna be fighting against all of these men because, you know, they are not going to like that she has this gift that she can do their job better than they can and she's a young woman and it just as i was thinking it through it just it was a timeless theme it was a timeless thing because these here's my daughter and her roommate these young women in 2020 worrying about that thinking about that and here's sarah who's going to be up against the same thing um so it just it felt timeless to me it felt relevant to me and i knew that that's what it was going to be so that's how it kind of developed. I love it. And honestly, as a hopelessly and helplessly romantic person, sometimes I would love a matchmaker. And I <laughs> really yeah, like, come matchmaker. on, <laughs> set me up with someone. But I also love that the immigrant experience in the 1910s, when so many people were coming from so many parts of the world, community and establishing a center of a neighborhood was so essential to thriving and keeping traditions alive. And you can see why matchmaking was so 
integral to an experience because you wanted to cultivate community. You wanted people to find each other with the same values so that they could continue the traditions that were coming from another place, like a patchwork quilt that New York is now. I just loved it so, so much. And besides the fact that I think a lot of us are now learning that men were the matchmakers. <laughs> How did that turn out? Um, was there <laughs> anything else you that surprised you in your research about, I'm sure there were many things, but was there something that stood out in your research about this time period or matchmaking that made you go, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. I mean, so that was, that first thing was really shocking to me. It was shocking just in my research that the New York Times was writing articles in 1910 with Yiddish words in them. And like, and that the New York Times was talking about the Shad Hanim, like the Yiddish word for matchmaker. That was really surprising to me. I just thought that was, I don't know. I just didn't think that the immigrant experience on the Lower East Side at that time was anything that any reporter at the New York Times would even be the slightest bit aware of, you know? That would have stretched um, beyond community Yeah, that it would have gone beyond and, that yeah. neighborhood or beyond the Yiddish newspapers that were printed daily. That was a really interesting thing. Um, there were just a lot of fun, like, things that I learned that weren't necessarily surprising, but just really fun. I learned about the Kanish War of 1916, which was a really fun tidbit where there were these two competing Kanish shops um, across the street from <laughs> each other. And they started like this war and one said like, I'll sell you a Kanish for five cents. So the other one did four cents and then one like brought in a band and then the other one started <laughs> to like, like you got a coupon for how many Kanishes you ate. And if you ate like 20, you got a pen knife, a pocket knife or something. So there were fun things like that. Um, there was just like, I did a lot of research actually about um, Jews at Barnard. Like that was some interesting stuff. A lot of that didn't really make it into the book. But one of the things that I thought was fascinating when I learned about the wedding of the pickle millionaire's daughter was that her, his daughter in 1909 was a Barnard graduate, which, you know, to have this immigrant like really still entrenched in that world, but I mean, they were wealthy because he had all these pickle stores, but to have her be attending Barnard, I thought was really fascinating. Like, I didn't think that that would be possible. That level of education, especially mm -hmm. at a society school, because we all know that there was still in that time period, the idea of new money and old money yeah. and pickle money was not the same as being like a Rockefeller yeah. Yeah. or Vanderbilt yeah. money. Yeah. That's and so they 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 allowed Jews. It was also just like the whole idea of allowing people of different, you know, religions and races and different things yeah. to go to a school like that. So there were Jews at there were a few Jewish women at Barnard, but and there were a few like this young woman who were, you know, not even born here or born, you know, their parents weren't born here, but they generally liked the kinds of immigrant people who were a couple generations out, you know, who didn't have accents anymore. You know, that was what the preference was. But um, so that was surprising. And then, I don't know, there were just a lot of fun things that that just all those tidbits, you know, when you do research and you learn all of the, it's like the lighter tidbits that always are fun. You know, yes. like, um, I find certain research to be really difficult, like World War II research is really intense and you cannot get it wrong. Like there is no room for error. You know, people will be very upset and people take it very seriously. But like when you're researching pickles, you're, you have some leeway, <laughs> like people don't get as upset. Because <laughs> they're pickles. It's they're great. Pickles. That's yeah. great. And I have a whole, I'm just cognizant of time because I oh, really sure. do want to get to our, um, our, you know, other reader questions, but Sure. I, I do really want to talk. Do you know what? I'm going to talk about this next. Um, okay. One of the things that you establish about Sarah and you, as I've said, this is a book that is so much about love and friendship and the connection between a grandmother and her granddaughter passing on stories, passing on wisdom between generations. I love the image of a beam of light passing from a man to a woman, which is how Sarah identifies a potential or prospective match. 
but you always ensure that the entire book stretches beyond the realm of just romance, not just, I love romantic love. I'm a romance writer, but also romantic love. And you do so in a way that forces us to also realize through Abby, who is a divorce lawyer, that love is far more than a transactional thing. And I love that you pit Sarah's experience about having to fight for love, given the fact that it's a very male dominated profession to Abby, who is experiencing her parents' divorce and experiencing the hurt that love has caused her. There's still always that beam of light. How, oh, like I could talk to you for like three hours, but how did you decide to counterbalance love with divorce and marriages that may not have always been a love match in history, but a transactional one? In what point were you able to just like put your personality in there and just think, this is, this is what I believe we need to fight for love. Yeah, I think, well, when I figured out that Abby would be a divorce, a divorce attorney, that was like a great moment. I remember I was in the shower and I was because it's where all the ideas come for everybody. (laughs) Shower or if I'm walking my dog. So I was in the shower. I was still like thinking this through. I was planning it out. And I was like, okay, the daughter, the granddaughter has to be cynical. She's going to be really cynical about love. I know that. I know that she's going to inherit this gift, but I know that she's not going to believe it. She's not going to necessarily believe her grandmother's stories. She's going to be skeptical about it. And then it just like hit me and I was like, she's a divorce lawyer. <laughs> like, of course she is. And her mother will have gone through this terrible divorce. And it will be kind of hard for Sarah because... Sarah won't be able, there will be some blockage with Sarah. She won't be able to find a match for her own children because like her gift has to have, have, has to have that limit, right? So she won't be able to find her own match or matches for her children. That's what I figured. And I didn't want it to be tropey. So I didn't want it to be that like she would find a match for Abby either because she doesn't. Like that would be the easiest, the easiest way to go would be, well, the grandmother's a matchmaker. And at the end, she finds a match for her granddaughter. But no, like I knew that I was not going to do that. So I knew that Abby was going to be fighting against it and that this gift was going to really get in the way of her job. And it does, like it really interferes with her job because she is supposed to be, you know, facilitating divorce. And instead, she sees that certain people actually should not be getting divorced. They should stay together. And she's working on a prenup for someone and she realizes these people should not be married. And it, it was really fun. And it was, it was um, I was a lawyer at the same time Abby was. So it was and like literally the same time. Like I graduated from law school in 1993 and Abby is a young lawyer in 1994. And I was not a divorce lawyer, but I was a trust and estates lawyer. And in big law firms in New York City, um, a lot of times trust and estates lawyers have to do work on prenuptial agreements because there's like estate planning involved. So I worked on one kind of crazy prenuptial agreement for um, an artist and he was marrying a young model. It was his second marriage and she was like 30 years old, younger or maybe 35 years younger. She was like 25 and it was a crazy experience for a lot of reasons. And so I channeled a lot of that into Abby's, Abby's experience. Um, but that just, I don't know, that just came to me. And I was so, so, so happy. I like got out of the shower and I screamed to my husband, like the granddaughter is a divorce lawyer. Oh, and it's also great because Sarah is pushing against the patriarchal male dominated uh, profession, but Abby is pushing against Sigourney Weaver as the boss and working girl, because she has a very dominating boss. And just before we turn it to Julie for some reader questions, because I have (laughs) kind of commandeered all of the questions, guys, because I love her so much. And I love this book so much. I just please give this book to people as a gift because it literally is a gift (laughs) of wisdom as well i mean it just rings my romantic heart when you weep the one you are meant for taste the salt of your tears like 
I melted into a puddle. Yeah. I didn't make that up. I didn't make that up. That's like a saying. So there are sayings. I love it. Of, like, yeah, there are a lot of little sayings in the book that the grandmother says, and some I made up and some I did not make up. So that one is like an old Hebrew saying. I but love I it. It's the most romantic thing I've ever heard. Like the idea that you would be so close to a person that if you're crying, the person across the room can taste the salt of your tears. That, it's just, yeah, it's the most beautiful concept. That empathy. Just, and yeah. she uses it really well. I'm not going to spoil it, but when it turns up in the book, you're going to go, oh my gosh. <laughs> there it is. And there's a lid for every pot. And I love that because I've always felt like the mismatched piece of Tupperware in the Tupperware drawer that you know that there's a lid for it, but it never fits. I, I just find that this is the most hopeful and wonderful and beautifully written book that I have now read more than once. Um, so thank you so much First, for all that you do to ensure that you're a light for every author, it's amazing how much you spend and devote your you time. Do. You do. For those who have not followed you on social media, Rachel does everything. Rachel is a writer. Rachel's an agent. <laughs> Rachel's a book pusher. <laughs> she, she does everything. And she's so, you've been so supportive for me and for so many people. So thank you so much. Oh, I really love it. Too. And I love this book and it needs to be a series and <laughs> I just love you. So thanks for it. And everybody, please, it, we're almost into yeah. the holiday season. It's Canadian Thanksgiving this weekend and this is everywhere in Toronto. <laughs> so just buy it this weekend. <laughs> and you're so right, Rachel. But you both do such an amazing job on lifting everybody's, uh, lifting other boys, voices up. And, and Sharon's on here saying book pressure. She loves that expression. <laughs> and that's what we all are. We're pushing, pushing books on everybody. <laughs> It's kind of a noble thing to do, I think. You have it's to a push fun thing. You know, yeah. You might as right. well push books. Right. And Rachel, I'm so glad that you also mentioned the salt tears quote because that is just the best. It's the best. and it's perfectly placed. Perfectly as a writer placed. and a reader, I can tell you that when it comes up you're going to get shivers. Well, so and that's good. what, well, Annabelle, <laughs> Annabelle's on here. You've got some great comments um, in the section here. Annabelle does say she loves um, the gifts, the way the gifts get in the way. It doesn't solve all of everybody's problems. And she says, this is just such a crazy smart book, the way it was put together and thought through. And I concur. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> And let's see, uh, Anissa's on here. One of the, the it, this goes back because sometimes people are, are throwing in their comments when um, you all are talking. Um, but one of them is from Anissa is the heart is big enough to hold both grief and love. That was one of her favorite quotes. That one I made up. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a oh, really good so one. it's so smart. That one I made up. Yeah. That's a really good one. Okay. So um, our lead. So we are going to talk about this beautiful cover. Um, sure. I have a prop to talk about the cover. You do? Yeah, do you want me to show you? Yes. Do you want me to talk about it? Should I talk about it? Oh, okay, so her question is, I'll okay. tell you her question first and then okay. we'll talk about it. Because okay. she said, the cover is so beautiful. How many iterations of the cover were there before you selected this? And what input did you have into the cover design? So now let's okay. roll with it. Okay, so I had a lot of input in this cover, which is very unusual and has never happened to me before. <laughs> so my, I told my editor that I had a lot of thoughts about this cover <laughs> and she made a Google Doc. For, and said, put in your inspirations. And so the thing that I immediately thought of was I wanted it to look like a ketubah. So a ketubah is a Jewish a marriage contract. So when you get married, I brought my ketubah. That's my prop. Okay. I took it from my wall. This is my ketubah. <laughs> so it's a marriage contract and wow. it's, they are always like highly decorated and they're often like floral in design actually because of instagram there are so many beautiful like ketubah accounts there's one called tallulah's ketubahs and they're beautiful but but you know like so you can see like in this thing holding it up again like right it has like all the flowers like around the edges you know and it has little symbols so it has like a mezuzah and it has a house somewhere and it has like a little torah and so um this has all the little symbols and i said i really really would love it if you could put pickles somewhere on the cover and they yes. did so it's like there are the pickles <laughs> so instead of a house you know there are the pickles there's the wedding rings 
um, the, the spectacles because there's a whole theme of love at first sight and a spectacle seller and a bracelet and then the bride and groom. So they sent this to me and it was almost exactly like this when they first sent it. Wow. The only, and Michael Storings is the cover designer, by the way. And you may have some of his puzzles because he has, he does, he's a beautiful illustrator and he has gorgeous puzzles that are out. And during the pandemic, I actually did one of his puzzles. And then he was the cover designer for my book. So it was really felt like very special. Um, the ring, the only changes were the rings at first, there was like, a very blingy engagement ring. And mm. I felt like that was a little too romancy. And then the bride and groom got changed a little bit because I don't, they were just different looking, the, I, the, whatever it was. I actually was a little worried about the bride and groom because I was like, I didn't want it to look too romancy. So I was like, can you take away the bride and groom? And, but they really love the bride and groom. So that was a compromise. And it's not like a surprise to have a bride and groom on right. the book. So it was fine. Um, but I love the pickles and also, I don't know if anybody read the book, The Muse um, by Jesse Burton. That had a cover with like a typewriter. It's really and good, yes. yes. And it had That's all nice. these different little, and it had like a little gun and a little perfume atomizer and like yes. different things. And so that was a thing cover that I was thinking about too. And I said, I put that in my little inspiration document. So that's how the cover came And your me. blouses and shirts often so I, match I bought the it, cover yeah. I bought when you're doing shirts. events. <laughs> For all the Zooms, I was like, well, I have to dress appropriately. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. I tried. I tried. So this is my question. And, and I apologize if you, because I was in the background doing some of the stuff on Zoom and I might, might have missed this, but Rachel, if you already asked this, did you specifically pick the, for the modern part, the 90s, because there was no cell phones? <laughs> so a little, I mean... Yes, it made me feel better about writing that, but it really kind of followed from from how old Sarah was, right? Like I could only I couldn't push it too right. far, right? And um, and also in 1994, Prince Charles and Princess Diana announced that was like when their divorce was like oh, first right. announced, and that was like because I was what I was doing was I was like, all right, she's going to be a celebrity divorce attorney what are the big celebrity divorces? Mm. And so I'm Googling and trying to figure out, and that came up. And I knew she wasn't going to be working on it because that was going to be, there would be British. It's too you know. much. But right. I was like, I want it to be then. It was just like, I was like, I, there has to be something about that in the story. And it, there is, like there's, there's a little bit of that in it. Um, there's a mention of it. And, right. and just like I remembered, as I'm sure you, I, I would think that you guys both felt this way too. Like, I remember when they got married. I remember getting up really early in the morning with my mom and watching that wedding on TV. And um, there's a scene of that in the in the book too, because oh, yeah. that was, you know, like a really important wedding. In oh my yeah, I was I was actually in London. Oh I wow. think May before they got married. So I have like I was like obsessed. Okay, yeah. I have like the Charles and Di glass. I mean, <laughs> you have the mug. <laughs> okay, I mean it's like... yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yes, it was. So that was. So that's that speaks to the time period perfectly. Yeah. And I go back to whoever was mentioning about just all of these thoughtful things. There are all these little gems in there that just get put together so perfectly. I just I love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, next question. So this is actually for both of you. So Rachel, we'll start with you on this one. And and, and Anissa has said to, uh, in here too that she thinks you're awesome. So this is Anissa's question uh, for both authors. Is there a book that you would love to write, but you aren't ready to write it for one reason or another? So let's start with you, Rachel, on that one. Oh, yeah. And I think that readers and prospective writers should know that it's often because of writers these days we were talking about this before we came on in like the little green room moment. You can't just sit down and write the book of your heart and expect someone to publish it because it is very much like matchmaking. We've learned a transactional business that has to stay afloat. So there has to be uh, the concept of readers who are going to buy it and you have to sell copies so that you can keep writing. And I have not yet been able to write in my time period. I had to, had to, I wanted to get in the door and the open door was historical mystery. I wrote eight historical mysteries just to get into historical fiction with heavy romance, which is what I do now. Um, but I'm still not in my time period. I, I'm a Victorian literature 
specialist. Oh, okay. That was my background. And I want to write something so badly set in the Victorian era, but I know that I still have to pay my dues a little bit and I have to follow the marketplace. And right now um, I have found, thank heavens, some readers in the post-war years, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to ease myself into the next phase. So yes, but I will say this, I stitch and sew parts of things that I'm very passionate about into every book that I write. So even if I'm not completely in the book that I've always wanted to try that I'm not ready yet because of the market, because of where I am, I leave breadcrumb trails so that the readers who follow me when this book does happen and it's this Victorian set epic with Gothic tones will not feel like they've been shoved into a new world. They have been led there by someone who has threaded through all of the things that she's passionate about, but perhaps pronounces herself in a bit of a nuanced way. Like all the, all the little, you know. Well, oh, I can't wait because that sounds like it's my to perfect time period too. I love all the gothic. So can't yeah. wait for that. <laughs> Hopefully that gets written soonish. I know everybody. <laughs> <laughs> buy a book of mine someday and yeah. we will work towards it we'll work towards that one so how about you linda is there a book out there that um you would want to write but haven't yet i mean i'm i oh, i have i am just always i feel like rachel i feel like rachel is this way too i have a lot of stories in my head all the time and so this book was a little bit of a departure for me actually i mean there's a little bit of magical realism in it, which I've never done before. And so I was really worried about that. I didn't know if that would hit the right way and if I could carry that and pull that off. Um, so I was so happy when my editor first read it and she said that it worked because I didn't know if I could do that. I think, and what Rachel said is right, like you can't, if you write a certain kind of book and you just go off on a complete tangent. It's hard sometimes for readers to follow. It's hard for publishers to follow. But I think you can sort of, I think with this book, I'm sort of making my way slowly to something slightly different, um, you know, where I can incorporate some magical realism, where I can write like a story that's a little more joyful because my other two books were more serious. I really wanted to write those books. I love writing those books, but this book, I loved also and I I feel like as you get older and as the world changes there are just different books that are right for certain time periods so mm -hmm. right now the book like my next book is more like the matchmaker's gift than not you know it's it. also yep. historical but it has a little dash of magical realism and it's it's also like kind of a heartwarming story well, and I mean, I loved it. And Rachel, you pointed it out too. I mean, this whole, just the whole timing of this with the pandemic, I mean, just everything, the connections, it just speaks to the moment so perfectly right now. Um, but also um, it must be interesting for you, Linda, and also you, Rachel, um, to kind of challenge yourself in like the magical realism. Could you pull it off? Because as a writer, you probably have to do things that kind of keep you interested mm -hmm. and, and challenged. It's, I have a lot of, um, I'm very close with Alison Richman, who is also a historical fiction writer, and she's so lovely. And Alison's just a very sensitive, very heartfelt person. And she always says, like, I can't write something if it doesn't speak to me. I can't write something if it's not, like, in my soul. So I, it's very true that we have to write toward the marketplace, but we also... I don't think I could write a story and I don't think you could either, Rachel, if I didn't yeah. really love it. So even though there's, it might not, even though I might want to also write something else, I couldn't have written this book if it just wasn't completely in my gut to write it, right. you know? Yeah. So yeah I, I you think, have to yeah. find the interception of passion and market. And this is a conversation I have with Kate Quinn, who's a Warwick's favorite. Yes. Alive, because she is a Roman historian. She loves the Baroque yeah. period. She's currently writing, you know, books set in World War II. How do you find ways to fuse your passion and personality into the topics and genres and time periods that are going to speak to the masses? And I find that 
matchmaker's gift is not a major departure if you know Linda's themes from her previous books. And yet it just makes sense that this would be the next rung of the ladder for you, yeah. Linda, especially for people who follow you on social media. Because I can always tell, and I'm sure you can, Julie, when you read a book that an author's personality just blasts through it, you can tell mm -hmm. that they enjoyed this. Right. And you clearly, Linda, it was so much fun. Enjoyed yeah. writing this book. Yeah, really I love yeah. that. It also, I wrote this book so much faster than I had written any book before. Yeah. It just like, it, it I, don't, I wouldn't say it poured out because nothing pours out because it's always hard, but it definitely, I was, I was so excited every morning to write this book. It really got me through the pen. It really got me through the pen. Yeah. Really well, and I mean, I've heard authors say that if you aren't having fun and interested, your readers probably aren't either, you know? So, I mean, I think that's a really key thing that it's like you, you, you have to, it has to speak to you. Before We've all read those readers. books. Oh, yes, yes we have. Do okay, I have needs, to be here? You didn't want to be here. You didn't want to be here right Why now. is anyone here? <laughs> <laughs> and that's that 100 page where you go, okay, we're going to put that one aside now. <laughs> well, sometimes somebody has a really good idea for a book, but having an idea for a book doesn't mean that it's going to be a good book, even if it's a good idea. Correct. Like it might have been a really good short story, or it might have been a really good essay or a poem, but maybe not a whole novel. A whole like, novel. Yeah. It just doesn't work. You, Cause you can feel that in that, I always call it the middle slump. Yeah. You can feel that at about that 150. It's yeah. just like, oh, where are we going here now? Yeah. Which is where we... it usually gets over edited because yeah. everyone's trying to band-aid up yeah. the gaping right. wounds of this yeah. Yeah. book yeah. that no one wanted yeah. to write. Yeah, and it's like, and okay, now we're like, super. Yeah, and then the super fast ending, right? Where it's like, <laughs> oh. It's like all these, and then like in the last two pages, and everything worked out, and goodbye. I'm and so yeah, and it's like, look, I have to finish right now. <laughs> my deadline's coming. <laughs> what a deadline! <laughs> Characters, let me out. <laughs> yeah, those uh, those are ones that it's just like those. I've had a few of those where I throw across the room. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like when you leave when you leave a party and you don't say goodbye to the hosts because you just like need to slip out. <laughs> <laughs> You're slipping out. Slipping out. Get out of here. Okay. And he has another quick question. Um, so for you, Linda, when your characters talk to you, have they taken the story a much different way than you were planning? I always love this because the characters are in their brain, but I love because I agree with you, Adisa. Adisa, they're talking to them. <laughs> no, they don't really. I mean, maybe they're little things, but I keep I keep them pretty much in line. There might be a little, there might be a little thing. Um Little things happen when you're writing, but I, I, I do kind of keep them. Do you have a plan like the ending of this book, which I'm not going to give away? Did you know that that's where you were writing to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always oh my know gosh. the ending. It was I know so good. Ending, and I know like, yeah, I know the ending and I know like, like my dramatic moments. There's right. like things that I want to hit, like hitting my mark. You know, I right. want, yeah, that was especially true with my first book. Like I knew that I wanted to have a birth, a one-year-old birthday party. And that was going to be a thing. And I knew there was going to be a doctor's appointment and that was going to be the woman who's going to fill out a form. And like, that was going to be a big thing. And so that's how I've kind of been. And then actually, as I get close, when I get to like a hundred pages, I sort of, if, if I think about the book in like 300 page segments, which is mm -hmm. sort of how I think about it, when I get to a hundred, then I sort of, figure out my ending like i mean i i have the ending but i i i outline How are you gonna it get there i outline it a little bit and then i get to 200 then i get really specific outlining because i only i don't have i can't make it go on forever so i have to like figure out i only have so much time left so i get i start outlining more and more and more as i'm writing the book which is kind Could of like, i wonder if like Someday in another conversation, I'm going to just ask how Linda's lawyer experience feeds into her novel writing. Um, but I will tell readers that this ending is well earned. It's one of the best endings I've read. Such a in, good ending. 
You're so nice. Quite a while. No, it really, it really is. It's it it culminates in such a great way. It's, yeah, it's and like we were we saying, it's like so thoughtful how everything, yeah, how everything goes together. And Sharon's on here saying she can't read, re- wait to read the Thread Collectors. So there you go. Yes, the Thread so, Collectors is a great story. So with that, and Rachel, you mentioned so Linda for people who maybe don't follow you on social media, what uh, Instagram your probably favorite place to go? Uh, Instagram and Facebook. Okay. Um, I just have a lot of readers on Facebook. So just Linda Cohen Leugman author on Facebook, or you can, I mean, people follow my personal page too. <laughs> There's, you know, both there. And There's always a dog. <laughs> yeah. Always pictures of my dog and it's L Leugman on Instagram. And then if Rachel and I have a lot of fun conversations on Twitter, Annabelle Monahan chimes in. Christy I Clinton love Twitter. I've Twitter. actually learned to appreciate Twitter. Fun conversations on Twitter. Yeah. So my name, my last name is very unusual. If you just look up Loigman, L-O-I-G-M-A-N, you'll find me. Perfect. And Twitter is really fun. I mean, there are some really fun things that I love watching. It's how I get all my publishing industry. Yeah. Yeah. The pub deals. Like that's how I know what books are coming out. And then I can go stalk the authors like I did with Linda. (laughs) And yeah, I just beg all the (laughs) on Twitter. Yeah. You know, like people will say Twitter can be really negative, but I just, I just, just don't, don't follow. I just unfollow all stuff. those. Just yeah, follow, follow book, book stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's all book Twitter. Yeah. And like, I feel really happy. Like that way we became friends, right? Rachel and I became friends on Twitter. Yeah. Was, um, yeah. So Rachel, you're on Twitter is just Rachel McMillan, right? I'm always Rach K Mick, R-A-C-H-K-M-C on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest. And oh. honestly, I just, ramble on about books a lot and am a <laughs> giant nerd so if, if that but appeals you, to you <laughs> but you have some great nerd stuff going on and you've done some great interviews for us with just like this one so i appreciate both of you so much linda thank you for your time thank you so much for having us both was- rachel thank you for your time thank you this you one book is so good go get so it good go get it <laughs> get the mozart code too i put that link in the comments so thanks everybody and y'all have a great evening thank bye. you bye linda bye julie bye